Deep beneath the ocean's surface, buried in forgotten manuscripts, lie the naval inventions of our distant past. The Ancient Discoveries team of model makers, underwater detectives, and elite naval commandos are seeking to rediscover these lost military designs. They are performing a series of life-threatening experiments. Their results reveal that today's naval devices are based on the ingenious blueprints laid down by naval engineers thousands of years ago. This is the story of ancient naval technology. To explore ancient naval warfare, we must first piece together the story of the sea. Two-thirds of the Earth's surface is covered with water. It has been a battleground for over 5,000 years. It doesn't matter where you are on planet Earth. If you're by the sea, you had to have a navy. Crossing land masses was both expensive and very inefficient. Taking a boat from one area to the other was approximately six times quicker. It was a no-brainer. The drive to build quicker, larger, more powerful battleships launched an ancient naval arms race. We are finding evidence of highly toxic biological warfare, high-impact explosive grenades, underwater attack units that operate like U.S. Navy SEALs, and visionary devices able to turn sea into solid land. Every ancient civilization, from the Egyptians to the Greeks to the Romans, lived and died by their innovations in naval technology. And perhaps the most lethal of all such inventions came not from the West, but the East. South Korea is a glittering jewel of Eastern Asia. Yet for centuries, it has been a target for invasion by its two monster neighbors, China and Japan. Japan created some of the most terrifying soldiers in history, the samurai warriors. And China had the largest standing army in all antiquity. Korea stood at a crossroads, surrounded by two aggressive superpowers. To defend their shores, the small and vulnerable nation of Korea was forced to turn to technology to survive. In the later Koryo dynasty, the development of science meant we had advanced military technology. In 1591, the Koreans developed a vessel that would become known as the Turtle Ship. Within six months, Turtle Ship crews were being trained for a conflict that would become known as the Imjin War. It pitted Korea against a Japanese force over three times greater in number. At the time of the Imjin War, six gun ports were installed on each side of the ship, and a gun port at each side of the dragon's head. These cannons could unleash barrages of ballistic missiles. You might imagine that blasting powder balls were used in the cannons. But in the early ages, wooden arrows with iron wings were used. The wooden arrows were six feet long and designed to make a huge hole in the enemy ships. And the secret behind the weapon's potency was that iron wings were attached to make the arrow more deadly. These ship-to-ship -ship missiles struck at speeds of over 200 miles per hour. The secret of their power lay in the pioneering design developed by the Korean engineers. With its superior firepower, the turtle ship was able to demolish Japanese targets at long range, safe from counterattack, just as U.S. aircraft carriers do in the 21st century. In spite of the lethal firepower of the turtle ship, the Koreans were facing a superior force. If the enemy broke the first attack and managed to get in close, the ships and the battle might be lost. The Korean military engineers were forced to invent a contingency strategy. Unbelievably, the solution was to convert the turtle ship into a mobile floating tank. The War Museum in Seoul, Korea. Here, one of these extraordinary battleships has been reconstructed. 
The turtle ship deserves to be compared to a tank because it acted as a ramming ship. Its primary role was breaking through enemy lines and destroying their front line of ships. Then the rest of the Korean fleet struck forward. The ship was designed to ram directly against enemy vessels. 400 tons of boat, powered by 80 oarsmen, would crash into enemy ships. But in order to withstand such collisions, its design was critical. The ship's crew and rowers were shielded inside the vessel. Outside, the turtle ship was clad in iron plating, and these spikes were not just for decoration. Japanese ships would approach the Korean ships at high speed and jump on the deck to kill the Korean soldiers. This was because their ships were much higher in the water. In order to prevent this happening, spikes were nailed to the roof. Each plate carried a two-foot-long spike that would impale enemy invaders who risked an aggressive boarding. The turtle ship had become a giant iron cactus. But the spikes were not its only defense. Mounted on the front of the destroyer were the gaping jaws of a majestic dragon. Yet this was no decorative figurehead. Ancient stories claim that contained within its mouth was a deadly secret weapon. The front part of the turtle ship was designed as a dragon head with a mouth which served as a gun port and a small cannon of mythical power was placed there. A projector was also installed that could release dense toxic smoke generated by burning a mixture of sulfur and saltpeter. The dragon head was a prototype chemical weapon. It had the potential to deliver poison gas at an enemy. This predated the use of mustard gas in World War I by 500 years and began the technology of chemical warfare, a terrifying military option to this day. But poison gas is only effective if the soldier can direct it at the enemy, away from his own troops. Richard Windley is an historian and one of the world's leading model makers. He is fascinated by stories that the Koreans had mastered the ability to deliver chemical gas to their enemies. He has constructed a replica of the dragon's head. He is about to test the effectiveness of the delivery system. If we think about the use of gas, say, in the First World War, obviously it was a very, very dangerous technique. It only needed the wind to change, and the gas could actually affect the people who were trying to deploy it rather than the enemy. So it is a risky stratagem. Right, I've got one of the, uh, the little chargers here. I'm going to light this, pop him in the pot, put the lid back on fairly, fairly quickly, and then hopefully we should get some smoke. At first, the smoke lingers around the head. This would be lethal for attacking troops. But then the wind picks it up. The, the assumption is with, with something like this that it was projecting the smoke a considerable distance. Well, if you try blowing anything in air, you can't blow it more than probably about 10 feet at most. So really, it was just a way of getting this stuff into the air and dispersing it. But I think that with given the right kind of maneuverability of these turtle ships, it probably was a viable option. And what we have to remember is these guys were heavily outnumbered, and anything that would give them an advantage or that would save their culture and their civilization and their country was something that, that they would fight very hard to realize. If the turtle ship captains had been able to position themselves upwind of the enemy, the poisonous gas could have been delivered without the Korean commanders killing their own troops. The use of toxic gas remained at the mercy of the wind until the delivery of gas by mortar in the trenches of World War I. From its lethal arsenal to the ramming potential of its spiked cladding, the turtle ship was a weapon capable of changing the tide of war. But Eastern Asia was home to an even more lethal seafaring superweapon. One of the greatest underwater discoveries of the modern age has shown how high explosives rocked the high seas almost a millennium ago.
nearly a thousand years ago, a great Mongol warlord launched a naval fleet that would dwarf any modern navy. It had over 10 times more battleships than all the ships of the entire American Navy today. On board was the most lethal military hardware available at the time. Evidence lying 50 feet beneath the waves is suggesting that the Mongol generals supplied their marines with high explosive grenades. In the 13th century, Kublai Khan was the ruthless warlord who commanded an aggressive expansionist superpower. At the height of its power, the Mongol Empire covered 12 million square miles, over three times the size of the entire United States. But one nation held out against the might of the largest continuous superpower in history. That nation was Japan. Kublai Khan wanted to stamp out the Japanese pirates from the east, whose raids were crippling Mongol trade routes. In the summer of 1281, Japan's fate hung in the balance. If Japan lost, it wouldn't be the same country. This was the first invasion attempt from abroad, and the fact that people came together to repel it perhaps engendered a sense of nationhood. He prepared an invasion fleet of epic proportions. The largest fleets ever put together in the medieval world were those that Kublai Khan produced for his invasions of Japan in 1274 and 1281. The second and largest of these comprised more than 4,000 ships and 100,000 soldiers. This was probably the largest naval flotilla ever assembled prior to D-Day. Just as with the Normandy landings in the Second World War, committing such an enormous fleet to sea was a huge gamble. If it paid off, it would destroy Japan. But just off the coast, a fierce storm blew up. Severe gales whipped the seas into a churning fury that destroyed the entire fleet. Thousands of lives were lost. Japanese people believed that their nation was protected by God. And when the Mongols attacked, historical record indicate that there was a great typhoon, and people believe that this wind was brought by gods. They called it divine wind, which in Japanese is pronounced kamikaze. This would be the rallying cry of Japanese suicide bomber pilots who destroyed American ships and morale in World War II, 500 years later. Just off the Japanese coast at a place called Takashima Bay, archaeologists have made one of the world's most incredible discoveries. Khan's lost fleet has at last been found beneath the waves. At Takashima Museum, the exquisite remains are preserved. Takashima underwater archaeology site is one of the first underwater excavation that took place, and it's one of the biggest center for the underwater archaeology. There are iron swords, stone catapult balls, and this huge anchor. These are wooden artifacts that were excavated, and it is mainly parts of ships and maybe shipboard material. But the most intriguing of all the artifacts from the Takashima Bay wrecks are these simple hollow spheres. Closer inspection reveals evidence of explosion damage. And intriguingly, the damage appears to come from a force inside the objects themselves. Were these devices the world's first high explosive grenades? In the sacred confines of the Hakozaki Shrine Museum in Fukuoka, Japan, lies a clue that could be the final piece in the puzzle. An ancient scroll guarded by the high priests of one of Japan's three great shrines. The scroll depicts events from around 700 years ago. 
from this area where the Mongol invasion first started. The Mongols were an equestrian people, but had a device that utilized gunpowder. The Japanese had never before encountered explosives and were very surprised. Upon close inspection, one sequence in the scroll contains exciting evidence of the use of the balls at the Takashima Bay wreck. The scrolls tell of a lethal explosive weapon like a modern grenade. The ancients called it a tetsuhao. Six of these weapons have actually been discovered by archaeologists proving that the contemporary evidence was correct and that weapons of this level of, of sophistication and deadliness were in fact used as early as 1281. X-rays of unexploded Tetsuhao reveal that they were filled not just with gunpowder, but also with deadly shards of iron. The Tetsuhao could have been launched using catapults or simply thrown by hand, like a modern infantry grenade. The results would have left the Japanese shocked and terrified. Japanese has never seen such a weapon that makes loud noise and explode. And also, it's gonna slice the enemy's armor and hand and everywhere, so it's gonna lower the moral of the enemies. But just how devastating these ancient bombs really were has never been tested until now. Ancient technology expert Richard Windley is investigating the killing potential of the ancient Tetsuhao. He has created a reconstruction of the fabled Japanese grenade. These are made of kind of heavy stoneware pottery, very crude, very roughly made, but quite heavy and quite large. What we're looking at is something which probably replicates what we would now call a modern fragmentation grenade. So this is intended to cause as much physical damage as is possible to cause. It was actually quite a nasty weapon. Now comes the moment of truth for the ancient Tetsuhao. Our weapons test will involve highly dangerous live explosives. So we've called in the pyrotechnics team behind James Bond and other Hollywood blockbusters. We're gonna look around the hay bales. So we've gotta be close enough, protect that. So we hay bales and sandbag wall between that and the explosive charge. An ancient Tetsuhao has not been exploded for nearly a thousand years. The exact blast radius is not known. So the team has retreated 200 feet. The Tetsuhao is believed to create an incredible blinding flash upon ignition. To capture this, we've brought in specialist slow motion cinematography. Captured at 10,000 frames per second, this footage unveils the terrifying inferno that would have engulfed the Japanese warriors. The Tetsuhao ignites at temperatures of up to 700 degrees Fahrenheit. The explosion would have a 100% lethality rate at a blast radius of 20 feet. Our groundbreaking experiment has proved that the Mongols could have literally incinerated Japan's navy. But not all naval innovations involved complicated explosive chemistry. The Romans developed a piece of wooden military hardware that looks as dramatic as it really is. It changed the course of an entire war in only a few hours. Two thousand years ago, the dominant superpower in the ancient world was the great empire of Rome, policed by the legions, the first full-time professional army in history. The Roman Empire spanned across two and a half million square miles of land. But in the third century BC, a rival superpower grew up in the desert of North Africa. Its name was Carthage. Carthage, initially an outpost of Phoenicia in, in Palestine, becomes the trading superpower of the Mediterranean. And the struggle between Rome and Carthage is a struggle for power and control over trade and land and critical supplies, most important of which are things like grain. On one hand stood Rome's colossal army of over 350,000 well-drilled and well-armed soldiers. On the 
other, Carthage's domination of the sea. They fight first over Sicily, which is an enormous granary, either for Rome or for Carthage. And it's life and death. No grain, no bread, no success. At the heart of Carthaginian naval power was its magnificent circular harbor. Built to house over 200 super destroyers, the harbor was Carthage's military headquarters. While a modern US aircraft carrier takes five years to build, Carthaginian engineers constructed warships in the blink of an eye. Ancient accounts tell of such ships being built in 40 days from the moment the tree was first felled. Between Carthage and Rome lay the Mediterranean Sea, a battlefield of almost one million square miles. The Mediterranean became the focal point for a fearsome power struggle. Key ancient navies could outperform others not by numbers, but by skill. The Athenians, the Rhodians, the Carthaginians had major advantages in seafaring skills. But two and a half thousand years ago, the Roman Navy was almost non-existent, save for a few river patrol boats, the remains of which now lie in Mainz Museum, Germany. The Mainz Type A boats were elegantly designed. They are very narrow and long. There's definitely no evidence that these ships had been used for fighting because they are too small, too narrow, but they were evidently used to control the river. But Rome's riverboats would be no match for the might of Carthage's navy. How could the Roman generals bring their military superiority onto the open ocean? They copied Carthaginian vessels, they mass produced them, and they developed new tactics to negate Carthaginian skill and replace it with Roman power. They turned sea battle into land battle. The Roman military engineers started building boats with a super destroyer known as the Quinqueream at the head of the fleet. A hundred feet long, it was the fast attack heavy troop carrier of the ancient world. The Quinqueream was a huge naval vessel. There are probably 700 people rowing it. These are incredibly expensive, incredibly complex bits of machinery. But the troops carried by the Quinqueremes were not Marines or Navy SEALs. They were legionnaires, infantrymen used to fighting on land. The Romans needed to develop a way of getting their legions onto the decks of the Punic warships as quickly as possible. Roman naval engineers proposed an ingenious solution, a 40-foot-long, two-ton bridge called a corvus. It's basically a boarding ramp with a large spike on the front. You drop the ramp, the spike sticks in the enemy ship, and your Roman legion rushes across and chops up the Carthaginians, who are not expecting to fight this kind of battle. They're expecting to fight a ship-on-ship -ship battle, not a man-to-man -man combat. But would the ambitious new weapon work in battle? Richard Windley is investigating. He has created a half-size version of the Corvus. The real Corvus was something like 36 to 40 feet in length. It was four feet wide, probably weighing two to three tons, possibly even more. And the mass with the pulley on the top was something like 20 to 25 feet high. This was an enormous piece of kit. Lifting two tons of war machine on a single hemp rope with only manpower requires coordination. OK, hold. If the team or the rope slip, Richard and his assistants could be badly injured. Steez off, gently. Tie it off. OK, I've got it. Clear, please. Clear, clear. When released, there were no second chances. Aim had to be perfect. Three, two, one. Right, well, um, it looks as though we're pretty well impaled. It, it is effective at locking the two ships together, and it would have been reasonably effective in the right circumstances. However, Richard's experiment has revealed a weakness with the Corvus. It would have needed probably quite a lot of training to get the timing exactly right, the release exactly right. Again, with the ships pitching and waving, moving one against the other, the timing would have been absolutely crucial. 
even this scaled down example is a struggle for Richard and his assistants to raise a second time. And Richard's model is revealing further problems. The problem with this is we're, we're on dry land, we're on a stationary position. You know, one can imagine that uh, ships at sea, amidst all the turmoil of battle, ships waving, twisting, moving around, this thing would be really very, very difficult to maneuver. The 40-foot height upset balance and turned a slick attack ship into a clumsy vessel, difficult to maneuver. The immense weight towering above the deck of a rolling cruiser made the vessel unstable. If the seas picked up, the top-heavy device could easily flip the ship over. But Carthage needed to be crushed at sea. Despite the risks, the Romans installed the device. Would the calculated gamble pay off? In 245 BC, the Romans launched the largest fleet of attack ships they had ever put to sea, all armed with a corvus. But only a few miles out of harbor, they hit rough seas. The instability of the vessel caused by the corvus was too much for the captains, and they could not control their ships. It's too cumbersome, it's too bulky, it, it breaks all the rules. And the Romans invariably find themselves in a storm. And not being very good seamen, they don't see it coming, and they don't know how to deal with it, so they lose their fleet. 270 vessels went down, with the loss of 100,000 men, the greatest loss of any maritime force in history, all because of these simple planks of wood. This is a very ungainly and cumbersome machine, and really it was a quick fix. It was a very ad hoc solution to a problem. The actual application of it had huge detrimental effects to the maneuverability of the ship, which were slow and ponderous already. The Romans abandoned the idea of the Corvus, and it was never adopted by any military force ever again. But not all naval battles were fought above the waves. The quest for maritime supremacy drove ancient military engineers to look beneath the ocean's surface, pushing human endurance and sub-aqua technology to the limit, transforming ordinary seamen into the most high-tech elite special forces in history. The strategic importance of the oceans has been vital throughout history. We're looking at a world connected by oceanic transport. It's the only way of moving anything that weighs more than a few hundred pounds. The need to control the sea produced a technological and tactical arms race that has created most of the breakthroughs in military technology. It is the world's naval forces that have produced most of the innovations in warfare throughout the ages. Most of the modern sophisticated weapons in use today, including airplanes, bombers, tanks, you name it, they had to be the best because otherwise they were going to lose the war at sea. From the U.S. battle fleet of the 21st century, through the British domination of the waves during her empire, to the massive expansion of Greece across the Mediterranean 3,000 years ago, the nation that ruled the waves ruled the world. But there was then and still is today a need not just to rule the oceans, but rule the water beneath. Submarine technology and special forces groups in modern armies are the rapier by which generals can turn battles and even wars. Because undersea attacks can be secret, unseen by enemy sentries. Every modern navy has its own elite squadron of highly trained specialist underwater attack troops. Paul Haynes is a retired commando from the Royal Marines. Position over land generally requires vehicles. All these are less discreet or less covert than deploying personnel subsurface. But many special forces men and women might be surprised to discover that covert diving technology has been around much longer than we imagine. And the most important technology for underwater missions is to supply something we all need. It's oxygen, so that's the fundamental requirement of, of any diver. 
uh, a means of delivering oxygen to him to sustain life. The simplest way to do this is with a tube or snorkel. 2,500 years ago in ancient Greece, there are accounts of a spy named Silas mounting an audacious underwater mission to release enemy Persian ships from their moorings without being detected. The ancient accounts say that the secret behind his success was a mysterious hollow device like an ancient snorkel. Richard Windley has been investigating diving technology in the ancient world. It's often thought that the idea for using snorkels was derived from watching elephants uh, when they were swimming. These are actually bamboo. Uh, the original would have been the giant reed, Arundo Donax, which grew all around the Mediterranean. It grew to fairly large sizes. The device at the bottom is something I've added myself, because obviously if you simply got a tube in your mouth, you've got to look upwards all the time, and it's been difficult to uh, achieve any kind of underwater tasks. The texts show the diver at a depth of 15 feet, but due to increased pressure on the lungs, snorkels are only effective down to around two feet. So Paul believes the ancient illustrations are wrong. All snorkels have limitations. Depends upon the length of the snorkel, primarily. If it's too long, you'll have significant challenges in trying to breathe. So there is an optimum length for any snorkel. Richard's replica ancient snorkel is three feet long, longer than the optimum two feet. Paul takes the snorkel to its maximum depth. The results impress even this experienced military diver. Well, it's actually quite comfortable. Uh, I felt, felt like a, a normal snorkel. Uh, as long as it stays shallow, you can breathe comfortably. Uh, became quite apparent as you submerged and went deeper, you could begin to feel uh, the additional strain and pressures on your lungs. The test reveals that the ancient snorkel will supply oxygen to the diver very effectively, but only to a maximum operating depth of three feet. At this depth, the diver might be visible to sentries. For an operation to be truly covert, Military technicians have tried over centuries to create equipment that leaves no trace. Even modern scuba gear leaves a trail of bubbles that might be spotted by a keen-eyed sentry. To solve this problem, modern special forces use a device known as a rebreather. Incredibly, this device allows the diver to breathe back in the air they have just breathed out, leaving no bubbles at all. What we have here today is the stealth rebreather, which is the most modern uh, military underwater life support system there is at the moment. The diver's breathing from these bags, or counterlunts as they're called, um, and breathing through the hoses into the bags. And the gas then goes through what's called a scrubber, and that absorbs the carbon dioxide that you produce. Then back round to the diver, so he inhales fresh gas. But amazingly, this ultra-high-tech equipment might have its roots in a device created for assault troops thousands of years ago. In 1000 BC, Assyria was a major superpower of the ancient world, controlling an empire of thousands of square miles. Within its dominion and along its borders were plateaus and fertile valleys crisscrossed with rivers. As the empire grew, her armies needed to attack across these waterways. There is evidence 300 miles away in London, England, that offers a clue as to how they approached this. The British Museum in London contains the world's largest collection of ancient artifacts. Here, Dr. John Bevan is investigating evidence that suggests the ancient Assyrians used a re-breathing device nearly 3,000 years ago. The museum contains a relief carving that depicts an Assyrian military assault. Siege tactics, chariots, and heavy infantry are all shown. But a portion of the relief tells the story of a river assault. This depicts a river crossing of the Assyrian army, possibly the Euphrates. 
and it's a massive operation, a huge logistical problem. You've got to get all your troops and your horses and your chariots across the river. And uh, it's a wonderful uh, illustration of the problems they're facing in crossing a river. There is evidence in the carving of a mysterious piece of military technology. This has puzzled people for a long time. Uh, it shows an Assyrian soldier uh, holding what appears to be a goat, an inflated goat skin or bladder uh, underneath him. It's strapped to his body. He's got a tube into his mouth. Now, some people have thought that this depicts a diver swimming along underwater in a clandestine or covert way. The swimmer would have breathed oxygen in and out of the bag. Many believe that this is evidence of the world's first underwater rebreather. Others predict that the device would never have worked. Entering the debate is the Ancient Discoveries team. Richard Windley has created a replica of the ancient Assyrian rebreather. Today, for the first time, our intrepid trio of scholar, ancient model maker, and military commando have returned to Pinewood's diving stage to test Richard's creation. The trials will require Paul to submerge beneath the water with no oxygen supply. He will only be able to breathe the air he has already breathed out. There is evidence from nearly 3,000 years ago of covert underwater assault technology. These images suggest that the ancient Assyrians developed a device that allowed them to mount an attack while breathing air underwater without leaving any trace of bubbles. The perfect weapon for a covert subsurface attack. Ancient model maker Richard Windley has built a model of the device. We think possibly the original versions of these um, may have been an entire animal skin, and these had to be sealed. And the way they did that was to stitch them and then use like a slurry of um, all sorts of bizarre mixtures like honey and beeswax. This actually does a fairly good job of, uh, of waterproofing. Today, ex-Royal Marines Commander Paul Haynes is going to test the model. Is this the first ever completely covert military equipment? The experiment gives a clear result. The challenge is straight away, uh, it's positive buoyancy. So uh, it merely wants to uh, lift you to the surface. Air has 800 times less density than water, causing the breathing bag to shoot upwards to the surface. Underwater operations would have been almost impossible, yet ancient reliefs clearly show it being used in operation. Ancient historian John Bevan has interpreted this evidence. The soldier, of course, would have been trying to get across the river wearing heavy equipment, heavy uh, dress, and of course maybe carrying some heavy weapons. So he certainly couldn't swim uh, with all that kit on, so the bag would have been there to provide him with the buoyancy to get across the river. The mouthpiece would therefore have been simply there to maintain uh, the bag in an inflated condition. The experiment illustrates that the bags were used for surface swimming rather than underwater swimming. This tactic is still used by special forces to swim distances with heavy weapons today. Of course, it is completely incredible to us that the ancient world could have had any underwater devices to explore the marine world. But Richard is not giving up in his quest to discover ancient covert diving equipment. He is examining textual evidence that claims the special forces of Alexander the Great conducted covert underwater attacks. Alexander was born in Macedonia in northern Greece in 356 BC. Alexander was universally considered in the ancient world the greatest general that ever lived. He was a man who led from the front, but also a man who took brilliant tactical decisions. Ancient accounts dating from the fourth century BC tell of Alexander's siege at the Phoenician city of Tyre. They have given birth to a legend. Alexander was said to have examined the city's defenses by mounting an underwater operation with a diving bell. The model we have here is meant to represent a diving bell. It would seem to me that this is probably the most likely and the most effective and easiest way of getting divers to undertake these kind of covert operations. The concept of the bell is relatively simple. 
air trapped under the dome provides a diver with an underwater reservoir from which to breathe. We lower it down to the bottom of the tank, approximately six meters depth. We've provided sufficient length here to allow me to swim in underneath and place my head and shoulders within the bell area. The air trapped in the bell will cause the device to float. To stop it from shooting to the surface, weights are attached to ropes around the container. It's going to be difficult to level though, isn't it? These yeah. weights provide a downward force under gravity exactly equal to the upward buoyancy force exerted on the bell by the trapped air. While Paul prepares to dive again, technicians maneuver the bell into the water. The operation is complicated, but finally the bell sinks to the bottom. While Richard watches from the surface, Dr. Bevan observes from a reinforced viewing window beneath the tank. With the bell on the bottom, Paul fills his lungs and dives. Once at the tank floor, Paul will perform two tests. The first investigates whether he can move around using the bell as a permanent air source. As he works, Paul is only breathing the compressed air from the bell into his lungs. A second test investigates whether Paul can make journeys into the open water and then return to the bell for more air. But with only the compressed air from the bell in his lungs, if he changes his depth, the increase in pressure will cause his chest to explode. This is an exceptionally dangerous operation. Paul relies on all his training to keep himself at the exact depth of the bell and alive. For this reason, he must exhale continuously as he returns to the surface. Once you get down and get settled, I mean, the breathing's quite comfortable and you've got good visibility. You can quite readily move around. You can use it as a stationary sort of um, resupply of gas um, to, to work from. Um, to, to do salvage work, simple tasks. Our investigation proves that before the advent of modern scuba gear, military engineers were capable of designing technologies that allowed their special forces to work at depth for long periods. It's extremely successful. It's exactly what I would have expected in the real world, so to speak. The bell has been placed on the seabed ready. It's got a full charge of fresh air. The diver's gone down. He's made himself comfortable. He's been able to go out do his dive, do some work, and then come back to the bell when he's comfortable. And so he's been able to work away for quite a long time down there. The tests at the deep tank have revealed that the ancients, two, even 3,000 years ago, did not just master the seas, but conquered its depths. Devices like the snorkel would have allowed covert operations. It, it functioned the way it ought to, that is, the diver's out of sight completely, and you've just got a part of snorkel out of the water, and that's not so easy to see. The Assyrian bladder, while not as sophisticated as the high-tech rebreathers used by today's Special Forces divers, did allow commandos to carry heavy weapons across the water quickly and more effectively. They're the equivalent of a life jacket, a buoyancy aid, modern buoyancy aid today. So it would keep you well out of the water. If you couldn't swim very well, it would keep you safe. And of course, if you've got any heavy equipment, it'll keep you high in the water again with buoyancy. And Alexander's bell has shown that even two and a half thousand years ago, military engineers were capable of designing technologies that allowed their special forces to work at depth for long periods. These technologies were being used by commandos millennia ago, and the principles and tactics they initiated are still used in the modern theater of war nearly 3,000 years later. The message that comes home to me is just how amazingly impressive and ambitious and technologically competent these people were that were building these ancient vessels. From technological innovation and experimentation beneath the waves, to the super destroyers that cruised upon them, 
the ancient military engineers were continuously pushing back the boundaries of invention. And as modern military engineers follow in their footsteps, they rely every day on the debt they owe the naval inventors of the ancient world. Ballistics is the study of missiles, of bullets, mortars, and rockets. Anything that can be fired across battle lines. We assume these are high-tech inventions of the modern military machine. New discoveries are forcing scientists and engineers to rethink this idea. New evidence is revealing that super-ballistic weapons were used on battlefields thousands of years ago. As they revisit the evidence, the conclusions scientists are reaching are explosive. This is the story of ancient super-ballistics. The ancients devised super-ballistic weapons of surprising power. Mega catapults that destroyed cities. Multiple rocket launch systems capable of firing 100 rounds a second. Anti-personnel machines that pierced armor and shields. And even handheld super weapons whose tactics and design is echoed on today's battlefields. The question being investigated by ancient discoveries is just how effective were these weapons? What tactics were used? What technologies were employed? What was the kill ratio they could achieve? Now, in a series of groundbreaking ballistic experiments, we put the designs of the ancient military engineers to the test. Our team of leading military historians and modern-day weapons experts are about to reveal that war in the ancient world was as bloody and lethal as it gets. The ancient battlefield is not a place you want to be. Each time the engineers, the scientists, the armorers came up with an advance, it became a more horrific place. It's incredible how advanced these engineers were at developing ways to kill their enemy. Eliminating or neutralizing your enemy has been a concern of mankind for thousands of years. Ever since conflict began, men have attempted to invent ways to attack an enemy while minimizing the risk to the attacker. The best way to do this is to put distance between yourself and the enemy. And this means attacking using projectiles. Ballistics is the science that deals with the motion, behavior, and effect of projectiles, like arrows, bullets, and rockets. The concept is as old as war itself. We know from the archaeological record that an understanding of ballistics goes back hundreds of thousands of years, from when man first used a throwing stick to extend the lever of his arm to make a javelin go further. When we get to the written record, we know that they were studying it as we do now, as a science. The quest to discover the origins of ballistic science begins in the East, in the ancient superpower of China. In the 5th century AD, over 1,500 years ago, China was the undisputed technological superpower of the ancient world. For over 2,000 years, her engineers were at the forefront of scientific development, creating inventions that continue to shape the modern world. And perhaps none of these have had greater impact than those designed for war. The Chinese military thinkers were concerned mainly with psychological warfare and with using the advances in technology which China's own industrial revolution had given them to give them the advantage over the rest of the world, the people they called the barbarians. Ancient Chinese military texts contain images and descriptions of weapons with comparable destructive capabilities to many of the weapons used today. This triple crossbow, first developed in the Song Dynasty, was a 25-foot-long siege device that employed not one but three bows to give it extreme power to fire metal-tipped missiles up to a mile. As early as a 1,000 years ago, Chinese weapons manufacturers were creating weapons with a lethal battlefield potential. This model of a 1,000-year-old flamethrower could shoot flame over 30 feet. 
the pumping action drew a flammable agent, similar to today's gasoline, into a tube. The return thrust expelled the liquid toward the enemy at a temperature of 900 degrees. One of its first recorded deployments was in a naval battle on the Yangtze River by the Southern Tang forces against the Song Emperor's Navy in 975 AD. Really, the flamethrower is one of the, probably the nastiest and um, most devastating weapons, certainly from a psychological point of view, but also from a point of view of injury. One can imagine the screams of people who are being burned and charred by the flames. Really a devastating piece of equipment. But even this lethal weapon had a limited range. It wasn't until the 9th century that the Chinese stumbled across the invention that allowed the development of long-range ballistic weapons. It is the one single Chinese invention that did more to rewrite history than any other. Gunpowder. Gunpowder is thought to have been discovered in the mid-800s AD. It was first used in fireworks, but military engineers soon realized its potential for war. It is the use of gunpowder as a propellant to fire missiles across the battlefield that changed the history of warfare and introduced a class of weapon we associate with the modern battlefield, the rocket. The Chinese not only invented gunpowder, but by about the year 1100, they had realized that by varying the proportions of the ingredients they used, they could produce gunpowder tailored to specific requirements. And one of these was the slow and even burning powder needed to propel rockets. But there was still a lot of work to do. Without any way of guiding the rocket, it would zoom about like a let-go balloon. To make the rocket fly toward the enemy, the Chinese engineers began to investigate ballistic properties. They turned for inspiration to a missile that had been around for centuries, the arrow. By adapting the use of flights to stabilize the trajectory, they soon found they could send the rocket in a straight line toward the enemy. This is the basic aerodynamic principle that underpins all of today's rocket technology and gave the Chinese a tactical advantage during the Battle of Kai Keng in the 13th century, when they repelled the Mongol invaders by unleashing a rocket firestorm. Not satisfied, the Chinese investigated further uses for their new weapon. They attempted to launch not one, but hundreds. The 100 Tiger rocket launcher was an extremely sophisticated and ingenious piece of equipment for its day. It consisted basically of a box launcher mounted on top of a wheelbarrow. The wheelbarrow was a, a simple one-wheel type as used on Chinese farms for hundreds of years. All of the rockets were fired using a single fuse, and to ensure a wide dispersion, the launchers were wider at the top and narrower at the base. This meant, as the rockets were fired, they splayed out across the whole battlefield. This made it much more effective as a psychological weapon because no one could tell where they were going to strike. A hundred rockets would be fired more or less simultaneously, spreading out over a very wide area, their trajectories hidden by the smoke and the flame. And the entire enemy army would have been in fear of the thing. Even though there were only a hundred missiles, it would be impossible to tell who was within the danger zone and who was not. The hail of thousands of rocket arrows unleashed on their enemy had similar devastating psychological effects as the modern multiple rocket launch systems found on today's battlefields. The gunpowder weapons invented in China soon inspired similar war machines to be developed throughout Asia and the Middle East. In Seoul, the modern capital of South Korea, in its War Memorial Museum, there is stunning evidence of a rocket launcher developed in 1400 AD, 500 years before the modern multiple launch rocket systems of today's armed forces. The machine is a development of the Chinese model. Scientists developed the Huacha rocket launcher, an anti-personnel weapon that was capable of launching a hundred rockets at once. Hawacha's weapons saw the most extensive action during the Japanese invasion of Korea in the 16th century. 
In one battle, it is reported that nearly 3,000 Korean troops repelled over 40,000 Japanese soldiers with the help of just 40 Hoacha rocket launchers. To maximize range and devastation, the gunners fired the rockets at 45 degrees, giving this weapon a danger zone of up to 450 feet. You imagine thousands and thousands of fire arrows hurtling into massed ranks of infantry. The carnage would be indescribable. But rocket-based weapons were developed one step further by the brilliant engineers of the Chinese military. In the military museum in Beijing, there is evidence that the military commanders commissioned lightweight, handheld rocket launchers. It's remarkable to understand that they developed a single handheld rocket launcher, a sort of very early bazooka or RPG. Perhaps not as accurate as a modern version, but certainly scary on that ancient battlefield. For the first time in 500 years, the Ancient Discoveries team will test this deadly weapon. The ballistics engineers of ancient China devised a range of rocket-propelled ballistic missiles that caused terror in the ranks of enemy soldiers. From single-target missiles to the ancient equivalent of today's multiple rocket launchers, the battlefields of China were technologically advanced killing fields. When the arrows come at you and they're burning with flame and they explode when they hit something, suddenly this is something completely new. You've never encountered this before. The effect is, is, is shocking, it's demoralizing, it causes panic, and each new development of weaponry would have that same effect. But in an effort to produce heavy artillery, the Chinese ballistics engineers employed a different principle, the lever. In ancient texts lie mysterious blueprints for an intriguing ballistic machine. In the National Military Museum in Beijing, military historians have recreated its design. First developed and manufactured in the 7th century AD, the Xuanfeng, or Whirlwind, is the sniper rifle of ancient catapults. Its main use on the battlefield was to be deployed to take out specific soft targets like enemy generals or other catapults. The whirlwind is light and mobile and could be quickly moved to tactical positions. Its big advantage was that it could turn through an arc of 360 degrees. So it had an arc of fire all the way round and was obviously useful for dealing with possibly attempts to outflank the army or threats coming from different directions. The technological principle is that the force pulling down on the short end of the lever is translated via the long side to the weight at the other end, enabling the missile to be shot over 200 feet. This catapult reached its zenith during the Tang Dynasty, where one ancient siege account from 617 AD tells of the deployment of over 300 whirlwinds. While the Chinese revolutionized lightweight superballistic machinery, to investigate heavy field artillery, scientists must turn to the engineers of the ancient Mediterranean. To investigate these weapons, scientists are first studying the underlying concept by which all these catapults work, torsion. Torsion catapults rely on winding rope made of animal skin and sinew. The fibers are elastic. They stretch as they are wound around a core storing potential energy. At Fort Nelson Military Museum in England, historians have recreated a model of the Greek ballista. Primarily a siege weapon first developed around 400 BC, the Greek ballista was often positioned inside large armored siege towers. As the machine is wound back, the ropes become more twisted around the wooden spar. The immense power stored in the fibers is controlled by the ratchet system that locks the bars back with each pull. At full extension, the power stored in this model can throw a 350-pound ball over 600 feet. If you put eight men in a row and each of them threw a stone ball, you wouldn't get eight times 
the effect. You just get a row of stone balls a few feet in front of you. If you wind up one of these massive torsion springs, all that energy from eight men is then captured in the spring and you can use it when you want. However, it was the Romans who took the art of catapult design to its zenith. Over 2,000 years ago, the supreme fighting force of the ancient world were the Romans. Pursuing an aggressive expansionist foreign policy, the Roman military swept across enemy lands, leaving a trail of terror and destruction. Rome was a, a highly imperialistic state, very aggressive, um, and, and one of the whole ideals of um, of the state of Rome was to um, expand its frontiers to, to protect Rome itself, and that meant having the frontiers as far away from the city as possible. Money was no object when it came to developing and enhancing these weapons of destruction. The Romans were spending the modern equivalent of billions of dollars on their army and their military equipment. It's been estimated that about 50% of the annual budget of Rome went on its army. And the centerpiece of Roman artillery was a catapult called the Onager. First described in 359 AD by Ammianus Marcellinus, its function was to crush walls and generally wreak havoc on enemy lines. The Onager is a more simple version than some of the machines that were used earlier, but no less effective. Um, it's called the Onager, the wild ass, um, because of its kick um, and the power that it produces. The true genius of the Onager lay in the simplicity of its design. The Greek ballista had two torsion engines, one on each side of the shooting chute. This meant two parts had the potential to fail. As the torsion engine is the vital part of the catapult, both sides had to be maintained to perfection. They did a kind of clever trick. They turned one side of a catapult onto its side. So in other words, the spring is horizontal. By placing half a ballista on its side, there was only one torsion engine to be constructed, maintained, and defended, freeing up money and manpower for other military demands. The Onager became the standard issue workhorse of the Roman army artillery exactly as the howitzer cannon is for today's armies. The first time that any of these weapons uh, come into contact with someone that's not used to them, they would have that, that wonderful, um, devastating, demoralizing um, kind of impact. These weapons, like the Onagas, are the ancient equivalent of uh, ballistic missiles. It means that you can fight warfare at a greater distance in greater safety. As part of her research into ancient ballistics, Dr. Kate Gilliver has constructed a model of a Roman onager. I've got a fantastic scale model of an onager here um, that's as accurate as we can get from the descriptions that survive from the Roman world. It's a fantastic piece of equipment um, and would have been very effective in the ancient world. It consists of a number of key features that make it such an effective weapon. We've got here the arm. This is what acts as the fulcrum, um, and this is where um, the power ends up to, to sling the missile from. Uh, down here, we've got the ropes. Um, this is where the torsion energy is stored. Um, the ropes are twisted, um, and as the arm is, is pulled back, they twist further, and a huge amount of energy is being stored in those ropes. This replica onager used in the feature film Gladiator is kept in England at the Fort Nelson Military Museum. There should be eight men, stalwart men, according to the Roman author Ammianus, winding down one of these machines, which gives an idea of the energy contained in the spring. The spring is made on this one of twisted rope, but in the Roman period, it was sinew, which was probably a lot more powerful. Nevertheless, we hope to get some sort of action out of this machine. The really key thing, the way that that energy can be stored and then triggered off at exactly the right moment, is this little device here. Um, this is a ratchet, um, and it's a huge advance in ballistics. The Roman onager fired stone balls like this, very useful for knocking bits off enemy walls, keeping the ramparts clear of enemy defenders.
with the collapse of the Roman Empire in the West. The knowledge of these machines was lost for centuries. However, another principle of catapult technology came into its own in the West. Instead of relying on the stored energy of the torsion catapult, a machine was developed that relied on the potential energy of gravity. Stop! The Ancient Discoveries team is on its way to Denmark in Northern Europe to test the largest ancient catapult on Earth. As ballistic science developed, missiles became even more effective. The impacts they delivered became colossal. To counteract this, defenders built thicker and thicker walls to withstand the crushing impacts. By the Middle Ages, walls grew as thick as 23 feet wide, thicker than 10 men. Attacking siege armies required the development of a much more powerful assault weapon. In China, a machine was developed that became the dominant force in siege technology for hundreds of years. Then we're back like 1,500 years or something like that. And from that, it gradually works its way through India and the Middle East and eventually reached Europe, uh, possibly, we think, around the year 1,000. And then it spread quite quickly across Europe and um, soon became one of the, the main weapons of major warfare. The trebuchet was capable of hurling the weight of a car a third of a mile, a devastating weapon. In Denmark, Dr. Peter Vemming has built a replica of a trebuchet. He is investigating the power of the machine. We have a lot of data from these machines, so we, we, we have a, a, a nice documentation of how, the, how they work. The trebuchet is located on the shores of Falster Island. Here, archaeologists have constructed a replica medieval town, complete with living quarters and a port. But on the banks of the river sits a site that would be recognizable to generals and artillery captains for a thousand years. A 50-foot high attack catapult, a trebuchet. The trebuchet is an improvement on torsion catapults because uh, its, its, um, its range is, is, um, is much bigger. There's more, far more power in this. And there are um, much more details that can be adjusted in order to, to get exactly the shot you want. The box weighted with 4,000 pounds of stones is attached to one end of a counter lever. Manpower turns the wheels that wind the rope onto a bar. This pulls down the massive shooting arm. Stop! The 40-pound missile is loaded into a sling that rests in a channel. The potential energy now stored in the system is 3,000 kilojoules. The machine is ready to shoot. Peter can now test how accurate the machine is and how much power can be delivered. In the river, Peter has placed a target. He uses a speed trap radar gun to measure the speed of the ball as it leaves the sling. The counterweight crashes to earth. This swings the arm up with incredible power, which whips the sling, carrying the ball into the air. At the target, the missile is accurate to within a yard. But how much speed did it deliver? 42, that's fast. A 42-pound ball traveling at 42 miles an hour produces nearly three megajoules of energy, surpassing the firepower of many gunpowder-based cannons. It's really the principle of a simple sling, very simple technology, but uh, very precise and accurate. Continued highly targeted impacts of this force could batter the thickest castle walls until they were dust. The trebuchet was a multi-purpose weapon. It could shoot anything the attacking force wanted. There are people who have built machines which have thrown like cars and pianos and things, so, so quite substantial weights can be, can be used. We know from written sources that uh, dead horses were used quite frequently, and a horse is quite a lot of weight too. In the ancient world, although castle walls were made of stone, many of the buildings and houses within were made of wood. 
because wood was a much cheaper, easily available resource. But also much more vulnerable to attack by fire. If the attacking army could get past the stone walls and set fire to the inside of the castle, the loss of life and defense capability of the defenders would be dramatic. Fire is, is devastating. Also, you, you, if you hit wood or, or, or people, whatever, uh, it, it's, a, it's a terrible weapon. A ballistic missile was designed that could do exactly this, and it was delivered using the trebuchet. From high impact stone projectiles to devastating incendiary bombs, the trebuchet was the ultimate siege buster of the ancient world. In Denmark, you do not have very easy access to arms. And being a man, I think that weapons are very interesting. And this is so much the ultimate weapon. It's the best toy I have ever had. <laughs> but not all conflicts were fought across moats and castle walls. Many happened in open battle. Thousands of troops faced each other in the field. But how could commanders attack such huge numbers of enemy troops? before the invention of high explosive mortar or the machine gun? The answer was to invent their own version of these weapons. There is evidence that the ancients invented anti-personnel weapons and the equivalent of today's rapid fire automatic gun. The ballistic scientists of the ancient world created a devastating range of weapons. From the long-range rocket missiles of the Chinese and Koreans to the heavy siege-busting machines of the Romans, the Greeks, and the Crusaders. As ballistics technology improved, the range and weight of projectiles increased. But there is a third vital element to ballistic warfare, rate of fire. This modern machine gun has a firing rate of 12 rounds a second. The automatic weapons used by modern armies use the recoil energy of each shot to reload the chamber and fire a second round. But even before explosives, ancient military commanders demanded that their engineers and scientists improve the firing rate of their machines. The simplest way to improve the firing rate was to use the soldier himself. The firing rate from a simple bow and arrow can be vastly improved with training. The bows are made of different materials, such as animal horn and sinew, layered together to form a laminate. This means that as the bow is pulled, the energy is stored without the bow snapping. In the right hands, even this simple technology can produce rapid fire. The Huns controlled a vast empire that came out of Central Asia in the 4th century AD. It swept across Europe. Conquered soldiers were amazed by the rapid fire ability of the Huns. For hundreds of years, the Huns' rapid fire secrets have remained a mystery. But now, in modern day Hungary, one man has resurrected the ancient art. Lajos Kasai is one of the world's leading archers and has developed through years of training the ability to fire the bow to the same standards as the legendary lightning strikes of the Huns. The ancient Huns used to hold their arrows like I do, enabling them to fire arrows one after the other very rapidly. To prove the effectiveness of the ancient techniques, we have challenged Lajos to see how quickly he can fire 12 arrows. Lajos is able to hit every single moving target. And he does so at an incredibly high fire rate. Twelve arrows in just 17 seconds. But the Huns had a second important resource, the horse. They were a mounted people, 
who used their extraordinary horsemanship to execute lightning attacks and rapid battlefield maneuvers. The challenge now for Lajos is to replicate his rate of fire while galloping on horseback at 20 miles an hour. At 22 miles an hour, Lajos fires six shots in 10 seconds. The Huns used the bow in a 180 degree arc and reached 300 to 400 yards, able to kill horses and even pierce armor. These highly mobile lightning assault troops were among the best trained in the ancient world. And the same is true today. Commando and paratrooper units execute assaults deep into enemy territory. Indeed, their very speed often causes fast attack troops to be surrounded. But even this was not a problem for the Huns' cavalry archers. By drawing the enemy toward me from behind, I can fire at them backward. A static archer uses his left brain, but a mounted archer uses his right, the much more intuitive part of the brain. But their success still relied on the training and expertise of the rider. The task of military engineers everywhere is to reduce the importance of the soldier by replacing it with technology. To discover the weapons of the ancient world that were truly automatic, researchers are investigating a remarkable machine. In around 300 BC in Rhodes, Dionysius of Alexandria created an advanced piece of technology known as the polybolos. The word literally means many thrower, and it is a contender for the first automatic weapon in history. Ancient weapons maker Alan Wilkins has recreated a working model of the polybolos. With its magazine capable of holding up to a dozen bolts and firing using a heavy crank, it resembles the early modern machine guns such as the Gatling gun, though it was invented over 2,000 years previously. This is the first known chain drive in Western technology, and these links are oak, plated with iron and pinned together, revolving around five-sided sprockets. A moment later, your trigger release is going to be operated by this bar here. The polybolos achieved a firing rate of 11 bolts per minute. The bolts are steel-tipped projectiles and are loaded in automatically using a circular revolving feed. The purpose of hundreds of years of ballistic research and military technological development was the elimination of the enemy. Students of ancient ballistic weapons technology are also investigating the sharp end of these weapons. What happened when the projectiles got to their target? Intriguingly, many historians believe that an anti-personnel ballistic weapon was responsible for this precision square wound and the death of this first century AD British warrior. But who killed this person? And what was the murder weapon? We have tracked down the ancient skull to Dorset County Museum in Southern England. For the first time, we will seek to subject the skull to 21st century scientific analysis to unravel this mystery. When I was growing up in Dorchester, I saw the skulls, I saw um, the, the exhibits in the museum, and one of the things that, that really um, took, took my interest um, when I was very young was, was how were these injuries inflicted? Um, what caused this damage? To establish exactly what weapon was used to kill this man, we have enlisted the help of forensic scientists who normally attend crime scenes. When we scan the skull, what we want to do is to be able to take a three-dimensional model that we can create a facial reconstruction. This is an adult male skull. It's in quite good condition considering the period of time from which it's come. There, you can see quite a lot of fragmentation of the skull where it's been put back together. And there's the obvious uh, hole on that side um, caused by some injury. Looks like a, a penetration wound. 
Um, we can't tell exactly when this happened, but sometime around his death. We don't know that it was a fatal blow, but it looks like it certainly would have been fatal if he'd been alive when he received it. Um, but you can see that it's not a post-mortem wound. This forensic evidence indicates that the trauma might be the result of a Roman super-ballistic weapon. This is a Roman bolt head from 2,000 years ago. Uh, you can see that it's uh, consistent with the type of wound that we have here on this skull. So this would be consistent with the type of weapon that could have caused this trauma. The question puzzling the investigators is, what specific weapon fired the bolt? I think there's only one explanation for an injury like that, and that's a Roman catapult bolt. Ancient weapons makers Alan Wilkins and Tom Feely have created Roman bolt shooters based on the blueprints and sketches from the period. This is the standard Roman bolt shooting catapult, which was used right through the period of Julius Caesar, right through the invasion of Britain. This ancient superweapon was known as a chiroballista and is the pinnacle of Roman ballistic technology. It is a small, highly maneuverable machine that relies on torsion technology for its power. This is so powerful that you need a windlass to pull it back. And we estimate on this machine that the pullback must be around one ton. It's really a robotic archer. And this metal trigger is an imitation of the archer's fingers that are going to capture the bowstring and pull it back. And then the missile will nestle inside the two fingers like that before the trigger is released. We challenge the team to shoot at an animal skull. If they can accurately aim the machine, we may discover the same shaped hole in the skull. This would prove Dr. Gilliver's theory that the skull in Dorset was made by a catapult bolt. The replica we are using uses three foot arrows with a bolt on the end, the size most favored by Roman generals. Scientists are attempting to solve a 2,000-year-old enigma. Analysis of this ancient skull has revealed a mysterious fatal wound. It's presumed to be a British warrior, possibly killed during the Roman siege on Maiden Castle in Dorset, England in the first century AD. An investigation is attempting to establish the murder weapon. Our team of weapons experts is about to test the most likely suspect, a Roman chiroballista. Will its three-foot bolts cause an identical wound to this animal skull? The bolt shatters the skull. This throws doubt on the theory that the Dorset Museum's skull wound was inflicted by a chiroballista bolt. But the results of the laser scan by Dr. Carolyn Wilkinson provide a new insight into the likely weapon used. The analysis reveals that the injury hole is at a slight upward angle. The catapult bolt would have had to enter the man's head from below. But the trajectory of a chiroballista bolt does not fit. A bolt flying through the air would be coming down on the victim not upwards. The chiroballista bolt drops down the list of likely suspects. No a standard issue weapon carried by the Roman infantry was a pilum, a type of heavy javelin. These are very, very close range weapon used against armored opponents so they penetrate the armor because this lead weighs eight pounds and it would be thrown in this fashion at about five yards and driven, driven into the enemy. We put the pilum to the test. If the hole in the skull can be shown to be made by a pilum, the team will be closer to a verdict as to what killed the skull's unfortunate owner. From the test, it is clear that the pilum penetrates the skull without shattering it, like the chiroballista bolt did. But there is a problem with this theory. A javelin or spear, when thrown, would be on the down part of its trajectory when it hit the enemy. 
The wound was clearly made by a weapon from below, yet the hole matches perfectly, the sort of hole one would expect from a pylum end. Tom Feely has proposed an explanation. A tactic employed by the Celt against the Roman army was to play dead. To counter the enemy's faking of their death, the Roman soldiers would thrust their spears into the heads of the enemy lying motionless on the ground. In this case, creating this square puncture hole through the skull, penetration of the brain, a fatal injury. From our test, it reveals that both the angle and the subsequent wound match our forensic analysis. A skull with soft tissue, a living skull, will respond very differently to a dry skull, one without soft tissue, um, which is how we can tell the difference between wounds that happen after someone's died and wounds that happen before. Um, but you can see that there's a consistency in shape. You've got a very um, symmetrical square wound here from the stabbing entry, and you've got uh, a broken surface here from the thrown wound. The results from our test and the forensic analysis has revealed that the murder weapon was most likely to have been a pylum used to stab the victim to death as he lay on the ground. While our tests have shown that the skull wound was not caused by a ballistic weapon, the process of doing the experiment has demonstrated the lethal power of projectile weapons. And other experiments and investigations have revealed the devastating potential of ballistic science. Heavy siege artillery, such as trebuchets, anti-personnel weapons, such as rocket arrows, and highly mobile rapid-fire techniques, such as used by the Huns on horseback, are just some of the tactical options available to commanders, all thanks to their ballistic scientists and military engineers. But there is one weapon from antiquity that brings together all these factors, the firepower, the range, and the maneuverability. It is a weapon whose functionality would not be out of place in a modern fighting unit, the handheld rocket launcher. Ancient Chinese texts describe such a weapon from the 14th century. But debate rages as to how it would have worked and how effective it was. Today, our team of weapons makers and explosives experts are about to test the handheld superweapon of the ancient Chinese battlefield. Our daring experiment will be carried out in a remote location in southern England. This is a very dangerous test and requires hours of preparation. Model maker Richard Windley and explosives expert Charlie Adcock are setting up the test. Richard has used ancient blueprints from China to recreate the handheld rocket launcher. This is one of the smaller devices. Um, it's not the smallest. The smallest one was called a bee's nest. And this was a portable device. It weighed two or three pounds. A soldier could carry four or five of these rocket batteries quite comfortably. A soldier would have access to one single fuse. So just touching one fuse would simultaneously ignite the whole batch. Richard hands over the bee's nest to Charlie, who has handled explosives on many motion pictures, including James Bond and Saving Private Ryan. It is a dangerous test and requires Charlie to handle the explosives away from the rest of the crew. This is probably the first time that the uh, bee's nest multiple rocket launcher has been fired in, uh, in modern times. Uh, we've got a barrage of 12 rockets. Um, the pyrotechnician is now fusing them up. They're about ready to go, so we're just about due to light them and see what the result is going to be. We film in super slow motion at 10,000 frames per second, 2,000 times slower than real life. After ignition, the multiple rockets leave the launcher in a devastating battery of fire. In under a second, all four rockets disperse over distances of 500 feet. The Chinese bee's nest launcher laid the foundations for modern warfare techniques. 
and provided the inspiration for today's rocket-propelled grenades. It is incredible to think that the ancients manufactured super ballistic weapons whose principles and tactics we still use today. Thousands of years ago, they were creating an array of weapons that would be recognizable to the modern soldier. Yet what new discoveries remain out there? Discoveries that will turn everything we thought we knew about the ancient world on its head. Will we have to rewrite the history books? The world's oceans are littered with evidence of massive earthquakes, mysterious floods of biblical proportions, ancient tsunamis, mega disasters that have destroyed whole ancient cities and made them sink beneath the waves. Now, all over the world, scientists are setting out to discover the secrets buried on the sea floor in their search for the lost cities of the deep. The legend of Atlantis, an earthly paradise that existed before the great civilizations of Egypt, Greece, and Rome, a mega metropolis destroyed by a natural catastrophe, now submerged beneath the waves. But in their search to explain the legends, archaeologists are finding that truth is stranger than fiction. Entire cities really were lost to the oceans through one or more ancient catastrophes, and only now are their secrets being revealed. Are these ancient Japanese pyramids 8,000 years older than the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt? The remains of the world's first city? Or are they just strange natural formations? Off the coast of Britain, a discovery that could reshape history. Have divers found evidence that the biblical flood of Noah was real? In India, one of the oldest civilizations in history comes a story straight out of Indiana Jones. This spectacular temple has stood for over a thousand years. But legends passed down from generation to generation since ancient times tell that it was once one of seven that have mysteriously disappeared. Now, under shark-infested waters, the riddle of what happened to them may be solved. Off the coast of modern-day Israel, researchers are discovering evidence of a miracle invention over a thousand years ahead of its time, concrete that sets underwater. One of the first places to look for ancient underwater cities is along the coast at the sites of ports. And none are more famous in all antiquity than this mega port on Egypt's North African coast. Founded by the most successful general of all time, Alexander the Great, the city still bears his name, Alexandria. At its height, Alexandria was a bustling super city, one of the largest in the known world. It had one of the biggest ports in antiquity, with 200 cargo ships rumored to have passed through its harbor walls daily, twice as many as pass through New York's harbor today. The harbor was guarded by a 400-foot-high lighthouse, the Pharos of Alexandria, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So important was the city that it was crowned the capital of Egypt for a thousand years, second only to Rome in size and wealth. In its heyday, Alexandria must have been the most fantastic place to visit. Um, it was very rich, it was very sumptuous, and it was a real magnet, so anyone who was anyone came here. But it was not alone. Alexandria formed part of a massive built-up development along miles of coastline, not unlike the continuous band along America's northeastern coast. But incredibly, Next to nothing remains of this awesome metropolis. Today, the coast is bare. How did it disappear? The answer lies under the Mediterranean Sea. Around 12 centuries ago, a massive earthquake rocked the North African shore. 
Alexandra unfortunately was built in a high seismic area which suffers from a lot of earthquakes. In fact, between uh, the 4th century AD and AD 1400, there was something like 23 earthquake events historically recorded. In 365 AD, a destructive earthquake accompanied by a huge tidal wave killed over 50,000 Alexandrian citizens, sinking most of the city's famous landmarks to the bottom of the ocean. And it is here that scientists must begin the search for Alexandria. Amazingly, their quest begins as far away from the sea as it is possible to get. Here, geostationary satellites of the type used by the US military are equipped with high-powered scanning photographic technology, capable of seeing what lies beneath the waves. This is a satellite view of the west of the delta of the Nile. You have here Alexandria, and here the Bay of Aboukir. And in color, you have all the sunken land that we have discovered below water. Using geophysical data from their satellite surveys, Frank is able to build up an accurate picture of the ancient topography of Alexandria. Let us zoom now on Alexandria site. On this satellite view of the modern city of Alexandria, you see in yellow all the sunken land and port structure which are now all under the sea. The mapping of Alexandria has revealed new information on the sunken city. Its infrastructure is larger and more substantial than researchers had previously believed. The underwater teams diving in the area are constantly faced with the problem of pinpointing their excavation sites due to poor visibility at the depths they work. We have developed uh, specific tools uh, for positioning, like uh, underwater differential GPS, which a precision of a centimeter and it's extremely efficient for contours of land and etc. When you are doing an, a specific excavation, we put grid sack on land and it's, uh, it's easier, of course. Without this technology, Frank and his team would be unable to mark out underwater grids that are excavated one at a time. It's a meticulous process that takes great patience and care. Using a water dredger, a kind of underwater vacuum cleaner, the archaeologists remove the sediment in search of artifacts on the seabed. The potential for site underwater is that they have not been looted for centuries like some site on land. And furthermore, it's a totally empty space. You can go wherever you want. You don't have a road, you don't have new buildings. You are absolutely free to expand your excavation into a direction you want to go. At depths of between 10 and 20 feet, the excavations of 2007 have provided further clues to the port's destruction. Byzantine gold coins dating back to the 7th and 8th century AD are being uncovered. No artifacts of later date have been unearthed, leading the mission to believe that the areas of the port that survived the destruction in the 4th century were finally submerged in the 8th century AD. But it is not only small objects like these beautifully preserved golden rings that the team is discovering. Egypt's underwater sites are littered with large sunken treasures, including sphinxes, statues, and stone blocks complete with royal signatures and hieroglyphs. On Antirodos Island, we have discovered a small sanctuary of Isis this beautiful statue of a priest of Isis, very well preserved as sphinxes. Uh, on the Poseidium, we found a full uh, wall temple. The new findings echo the descriptions of Strabo, the Greek geographer who visited the city in 25 BC. Unlike ancient sites on land, the artifacts waiting to be discovered underwater have for centuries been free from looting offering archaeologists a fascinating insight into Alexandria's once glorious ancient past. The team has discovered over 10,000 artifacts from their 3,500 dives, but this is only the start. The work is ongoing, so there's still many, many more treasures down there. Um, but in a way, I think that's one of the romantic things about Alexandria. It's almost like Atlantis. It, it really is a lost city. 
But despite its fame, Alexandria is not the largest port in antiquity to mysteriously disappear. Off the coast of Israel, archaeologists are searching for evidence of a huge harbor wall. Hundreds of blocks, some weighing up to 50 tons each, lie on the seabed and are believed to be part of a 2,000-year-old mega port, the New York Harbor of its day, that lies 25 feet beneath the Mediterranean. Can our team of underwater detectives unravel the mystery of the disappearance of the ancient world's largest harbor and unlock its engineering secrets that have been lost for thousands of years? Secrets that could revolutionize our understanding of technology in the ancient world. The Ancient Discoveries team is in Caesarea, modern-day Israel, the site of the ancient world's largest port, investigating its disappearance into the sea. This incredible mega port protected up to 300 ships and opened up the world of travel to thousands, kick-starting trade networks and ancient immigration in the Roman Empire. This was the first globalized empire, and to globalize an empire, you have to have great forms of communication from your roads that we all know about to actually the ports itself. You need central ports that can take the super tankers of the age filled with the fruits of uh, globalization. Caesarea was named after the great Roman emperor Julius Caesar. It was built by the Jewish king Herod to be the major port in the Roman protectorate Judea and the largest port in the eastern Mediterranean. The harbor itself was unbelievably huge, big. Nobody could see such a big uh, structure worldwide. It was the largest structure on Earth at the time. 90,000 square yards, that's a huge area. Trade from as far away as Burma flowed across Asia and the Middle East to satisfy demand in the major European cities of Athens and Rome. This trade, needed a mega port. Thousands of men were recruited from all corners of the empire to begin the 12-year project. He created a uh, water break that was 180 feet wide, huge. You could uh, have a highway on top of it. And uh, uh, it extended deeply to the sea, uh, almost half a mile into the sea. The eastern Mediterranean can be rough. A powerful wind blows up from the continent of Africa every summer, whipping the sea into a frenzy. The engineers needed to create a massive solid breakwater to protect the ships that lay within the port. To solve this problem, they used the very latest in cutting edge Roman technology, a substance that most people would believe is a creation of modern engineering, hydraulic concrete a technological advancement that underpins all of today's mega harbors. Professor Robert Holfelder has been investigating how King Herod's Roman engineers created concrete that incredibly could set underwater. I'm standing today in front of a, uh, a large kiln at a cement factory where uh, we are attempting, or this company is attempting to reproduce what nature had done for the Romans thousands of years ago. Perhaps we'll be able to learn something from the ancients by studying the Roman concrete. This modern plant in the UK takes limestone from the nearby quarry, then filters and mixes it with alumina, silica, and water. In a massive industrial rotating kiln that uses extreme pressure and heat, it binds the materials together to create the mortar. The Romans had the same product, but not this facility. They didn't need it. Uh, nature provided them with a volcanic dust, which they called Puis Pultealanus, uh, a sand, we know it as Pozzolana, found in the Bay of Naples. While other ancient civilizations understood how to make mortar, the Romans were the first to create what we understand as concrete today. They added rubble to the mix, or what is also known as aggregate. The mix underpins all the Roman superstructures built during its global dominance, like the Pantheon that still stands in Rome today. And my task in the last couple of years 
starting with my work at Caesarea, was to see how the Romans extended this architectural revolution into the sea. The Romans were faced with a problem at Caesarea. How do you make concrete set underwater? What appears to happen is that after the concrete sets underwater, the pores of the concrete are so small that in a sense, the concrete becomes impervious to the action of the sea. King Herod's engineers understood the waterproof qualities of the concrete and set about devising construction methods to build the gigantic port at Caesarea. Herod made the world's first artificial port in history ever. And he did that in a very novel way. He didn't take some kind of technology from the land and apply it to the sea. Instead, he used um, floating chests. They sound quite simple. These 45 foot long chests, which were really gigantic with wooden sides. And those were constructed on shore, towed into position. And they make a whole series of those arcing out to create a breakwater. Into these chests was poured the hydraulic concrete. As that said, these wooden chests would descend onto the seabeds and create a beautiful um, platform for the superstructure of the pores. Incredibly, this process is still used today to build modern breakwaters for the world's mega ports. But there still remains much mystery surrounding the disappearance of the ancient Caesarea Harbor into the Mediterranean. When you're at Caesarea now, you only see a very small harbor, a modern uh, fishing port with some crusader remains on one side. Uh, but the main harbor is completely submerged. Uh, and if you swim out over it, it looks like a natural reef. Uh, it's only when you look closely at the, the rocks uh, that you realize, actually, it's not rock at all. It's, uh, it's concrete under a marine concretion. Dr. Ehud Galili is one of the world's leading underwater archaeologists and has been researching Caesarea for the last 25 years. His main focus has been to search for clues to the mystery of the port's destruction. The magnificent thing is to go down to see the anchors and the, the, the stones still standing in situ, very well preserved, to see the towers, to see everything that was left by the Romans, uh, after 2,000 years, we can still touch it and see and, and, and feel uh, what they have seen and what they have felt here when they were here. Dr. Ehud Galili and his team are coming to the end of their quest to uncover the secrets of this lost superstructure. They have discovered the harbor remains at depths of around 25 feet and have been searching for the physical clues as to why the blocks are submerged. Over the centuries, a theory has emerged that, like Alexandria in Egypt, an earthquake destroyed the harbor. The team has pieced together the clues and found new evidence that is unlikely. There was a theory that a, a, a geological fault uh, caused the subsiding, subsidence of the west side of the harbor and caused the destruction. Today, we are convinced, more or less, that the, the damage or the subsidence of the harbor was due to the, the fact that the harbor was built on top of sand and it was uh, the foundation subsided and settled inside the sand. Evidence from the seabed is suggesting that the ancient world's first artificial harbor built with hydraulic concrete gradually sank over a hundred years before it was lost to the sea. The world's first high-tech mega port simply sank because it was built on sand. But ports are not the only megastructures that underwater detectives are exploring. In India, the hunt is on for the legend of seven temples. One of the world's most mysterious cities in the shark-infested waters of the Indian Ocean. The Bay of Bengal, 800,000 square miles of shark-ridden waters. Predators lurk including the notorious man-eating bull shark waiting on their next meal. It is here that tropical storms with rotating winds blowing at speeds of 80 miles an hour bring cyclones and storm surges to the coast of India. On its southern coast, local myths tell of a lost ancient city submerged beneath the waves, a metropolis littered like the legendary Atlantis with palaces and temples.
The myths of Mahabalipuram have been told for thousands of years, but were first set down in writing by William Chambers, a British traveler in the late 18th century. The writings tell of a once flourishing ancient city, known to those who visited as the Lands of the Seven Pagodas. William Chambers was the first person to pick up all these strands of these stories and point out that actually we can only see one pagoda today. Was it made up? Was this one pagoda so beautiful and stunning um, that it got extended into this figure seven, which has always had a supernatural religious importance? Or, as he suspected, did the other six pagoda temples slide at some point beneath the waves? The myths still repeated by local fishermen today, speak of six temples submerged beneath the waves, with this temple found on the shore the only one of the seven still visible. There were once seven temples. Six of them are now underneath the water. Everyone believes they are lost temples. Ancient texts have revealed to archeologists that Mahabalipuram was once a flourishing ancient port that reached its apogee in the 8th century under the rule of the Pallava Kingdom. This powerful dynasty ruled southern India for 600 years, growing rich through the control of important trade routes linked to the spice trade of the Far East. In the ancient literature, Mahabalipuram is described as a very important port town. Of course, as on date, we do not know where this port was located. Today, Mahabalipuram is a bustling town with a population of nearly 12,000 and contains intriguing clues for archaeologists searching for the lost temples about the town's glorious ancient past as a thriving city. These beautifully preserved ancient structures, known as the Five Rathas, date back to around the 7th century and were built at the same time as the missing temples. The complex is carved out of a single piece of granite rock, a technique that was used for over a thousand years by Indian architects and engineers. One of the most impressive structures to adorn the town is one of the world's largest bas-reliefs and also dates back to the time of the missing temples. This magnificent relief, carved in the mid-seventh century, measures nearly 100 feet long by 45 feet high and covers an entire hillside. But it is this structure that may hold the key to the whereabouts of the lost temples. Known as the Shore Temple, it is one of the world's greatest ancient treasures and a sacred site that has attracted worshippers for over a thousand years. Local people believe that this is one of the surviving temple. Remaining temples have been damaged or they have been lying submerged in the sea. If this is one of the mythical seven pagodas, legends tell that it was once surrounded by a complex of beautiful palaces and spectacular temples, built with all the wealth of ancient India's trading prophets. A complex on par with the ancient world's most sacred sites like the Acropolis and the temples of Karnak. So are the myths a reality? How could something on the scale of the Acropolis have left no trace? There seem to be two processes going on here. First of all, this coastal erosion. We know that the sand is eroding away about one and a half feet every year. So that means 1,500 years ago, um, the shoreline actually would have been something like 1,500 feet further out in the sea. The eroding shoreline in the area may be responsible for causing the temples to collapse into the sea. But archaeologists have another theory for their disappearance, a huge wave. The tsunami of 1797 is recorded as having picked up a ship of 200 tons and thrown it one kilometer up shore. So vicious was the killer wave. Um, and it seems very likely these were responsible, whether in one episode or multiple episodes, we don't actually know yet, for the destruction of the Seven Pagodas. This is not the only tsunami thought to hit the region. The 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake sent huge waves of over 100 feet to the shores of 11 countries, killing over 200,000 people. It also hit Mahabalipuram, wrecking its shoreline. 
For a few minutes after the sea had receded over 500 yards from the shore and before it came back as a violent tsunami, local fishermen stood face to face with the answers to this 1,000-year-old legend. A set of mysterious structures once buried beneath the sea. After 30 minutes, go down very far away. Again, coming water, rolling water, come up. Because I'm a fisherman, we can, uh, I save my things, but my boat, my nets, other village people coming just looking for a temple. Captured here by an eyewitness for the few minutes that they were exposed, this extraordinary photograph reveals the structures as the sea receded. Anandan was on the beachfront as the tsunami wave approached. After I, I tried to come and water coming and swimming again. The waves coming, the waves now, sea is coming. I tried to climb to the trees, to take to my daughter, the elder daughter, and also my wife take to my son. Possible temple, yeah. The seventh temple in the water, under the water. In this eyewitness image, the tsunami wave is seen here moments before it crashes against the shore temple. The shore temple survived the tsunami, hitting it at 100 miles per hour. The impact of a giant wave was taken by a sea defense wall. The question now facing archaeologists is, are these submarine structures a solid clue that an ancient city lies beneath this turbulent sea? Dr. Alok Tripathi is one of India's leading underwater archaeologists and has been searching for the realities behind the myths. Although the seas are rough, Dr. Tripathi has enlisted the help of local fishermen to show the ancient discoveries team where he has been excavating. In this area, we have got a number of submerged rocks which are quite high and their tops are visible during the low tide and found that there are certain human activity on these rocks. This is the second outer ridge. One is very close to the shore temple. They are low-lying and they, they are not exposed. Located at 100 yards north of the shore temple, the top of the structures can be seen at low tide. It's a difficult sight to excavate as the water is shallow and surges with each breaking wave. The diving there was not technically difficult on the basis that it was deep, um, but in fact, because it was so shallow in five to 10 meters, um, right at the edge of the Indian Ocean with huge swells coming in, um, it made it very, very difficult to um, be stable in the water and to, to hold on to things. Trevor, an experienced underwater photographer who is trained to dive depths of over 300 feet, has dived the site in search of the missing temples. Most of the structures are badly damaged and scattered in a vast area. What we were looking for initially were the uh, evidence of that it was man-made. Archaeologists are faced with the challenge of proving how these structures in the water relate in shape, size, and date to the temple complexes found just 70 yards from them on the shore. The Shore Temple, which essentially is a large megalithic structure surrounded by a low-profile wall, that was very much what we were seeing um, initially um, on the seabed. We had these um, blocks in straight lines that correlated very strongly with what we were seeing at the Shore Temple. What is clear from the underwater results is that there is initial evidence of the presence of the construction of stone masonry, remains of walls and rectangular stone blocks. You were, we were coming across um, other suggestions that they were man-made, where the blocks were very sharply cut and, and set into other uh, larger blocks, which was fairly good evidence of, of, an, of a man-made structure. Archaeologists believe that this is evidence of the missing temples, and the findings are related to what is on land. It's very clear these are man-made, and the architecture seems to fit exactly with what we're seeing on land. So was the myth of the Temple of the Seven Pagodas real? Absolutely. Underwater archaeologists are really only just at the beginning of their investigations in mapping out what lies beneath the waves in the search for this legendary city. Off the coast of Britain, divers are investigating a global flood of biblical proportions, one that could rewrite our understanding of history. Have they found archaeological evidence of the biblical flood of Noah?
Myths and legends of cataclysmic floods exist in all ancient cultures, such as the famous legend of Noah and his ark. Every civilization tells the story of the great flood that wiped out all but a few survivors. Incredibly, several great floods are generally accepted to have occurred as the result of the last ice age, with most of the glacial melt having finished 8,000 years ago. The ocean filled vast basins in matters of weeks, in catastrophes that are unimaginable in today's world. But did these events spark the flood myths found in all cultures? It doesn't take a lot of great imagination to understand the impact that these melting ice caps would have had on these communities. We have historical texts preserved in Mesopotamia and in Israel, in uh, India, and as far apart as Mexico, it's very positive to say that yes, this was their global flood. Divers off the coast of Britain have discovered intriguing evidence of a town submerged beneath the sea that may hold the secrets of the mythical flood. Right off the south coast of Britain is a narrow 40 feet deep strait between the mainland and the Isle of Wight. The Isle of Wight at the moment is possibly one of the most enticing, fascinating sights in England. The divers drop into water, the temperature of which can drop to 46 degrees. The work here is dangerous. The current in the straits can reach 3.5 miles per hour. A good human swimmer would have to swim with all their strength just to stay still. At the seabed, they reach the site. That black patch is all burnt. This is where the fire was. The base of the fire was here. Dr. Gary Momber is leading the investigation. I discovered this underwater settlement after looking for it about two and a half years ago and discovering part of a path, a fireplace underwater. The strata, the levels are very, very narrow. And, you know, whereas on land you could use a pick um, to excavate a Roman town, for example, if you use similar um, methods underwater, you'd go through an entire thousand year level. The team has marked out a grid on the sea floor. They carefully analyze each square's contents, looking for evidence of human activity. Just here, we might be able to see evidence of more burning. They remove the sediment from the seabed in search of artifacts. Over thousands of millennia, the underwater environment has preserved the clues. Back at the surface, samples are sieved. But what evidence will the mud reveal? Uh, what I've got here is a little flint tool. It's been deliberately made uh, from a, a block of flint. They've shaped it and chopped this bit out, and now they can use it as chopping implement. Um, it's very fine, very distinctive marks on the side, and it also looks like it's been sharpened. Um, it was found next to this piece of wood, and this piece of wood also has cut marks in it. Now, I suggest it's probably used for food making, and on it, it's got some a cut marks straight across the top here. It's been sliced off. Now, that was buried deep in the sediment over 8,000 years ago, and it's just been recovered, and you can still see the cut marks on it. Other samples have produced further evidence of human settlement at the site dating back eight millennia. But what suggestions are there that the residents here were evacuated during a cataclysmic flood 8,000 years ago? There's a human activity layer under there. Yes. Now all these mollusks eat their way through it. Ooh, I've been out to my jury. We have the old landscape. We have it covered in vegetation and trees. We have the underlying geology. And above that, we've got marine sediments, which show exactly when the sea came in and how it did it. And we got the dates for that about 7,950 years ago, I'd say. This site dates to around the Middle Stone Age, the Mesolithic. They were hunter-gatherers who moved across the landscape following the rhythms of the seasons. The evidence found at the site reveals a time before the English Channel existed and when Europe and Britain were joined. But after the melting of the ice caps, which covered most of Northern Europe, sea levels started to rise, and the settlement was buried beneath the sea. The Isle of Wight site is strong evidence of human settlements being destroyed by ancient floods. 
But these legends relate stories of whole cities being destroyed. What evidence is there of ancient mega cities being wiped out by floods or rising sea levels? Off the coast of Japan, a furious debate is raging. 80 feet below the surface, at a place called Yonoguni, lies a mass of provocative evidence. Could these steps be elements of a construction that formed part of a huge city temple complex beneath the sea? A mega metropolis that dates back 10,000 years. This would make it the first city man ever built. And if the residents were capable of this miracle, what other lost secrets might lie beneath the waves? In 1985, divers discovered these mysterious formations on the sea floor. The enigma of their origin remains a controversy among scientists and archaeologists. Yonaguni is a freak of nature, or is it a freak of man? It is the monster of the deep. It is the Frankenstein of marine archaeology. It's this monster that up till now, nobody's been able to crack. Um, you would need a Sherlock Holmes and an Agatha Christie to put on diving gear and get down there. It's that complicated. For some scientists investigating the area, these geometric lines suggest that the structures are man-made. It is a complicated stepped pyramid structure, built to provide protection from enemies, it seems. But more incredibly, Scientists believe these submarine structures may date back thousands of years to even before the Great Pyramids of Giza in Egypt that were completed in around 2500 BC. The question archaeologists must now answer, is this evidence of the oldest megastructures in the world ever? Underwater archaeologists are investigating off the island of Yonaguni in Japan whether these huge submarine formations are evidence of the oldest man-made superstructures predating the great civilizations of Rome, Greece, and Egypt by thousands of years. Professor Kimura, a marine geologist, has been studying the Yonaguni site for 10 years and believes he has uncovered new information on the date of the structures. At one time, it was thought that they might be as old as 10,000 years old. But as we have accumulated more evidence, I have come to think that it was constructed over a period of time between 3,000 to 5,000 years ago. But other researchers have doubts about its age. Well, what is this site? I mean, that is the $6 million question. This just completely runs contrary to anything that's ever been found beneath the sea. We have now fine settlements um, in Nagasaki Prefecture beneath the sea, and we know what they look like. And these things are dominated by pottery and flints and finds. Problem is, at this particular site, Professor Kimura, there is no pottery, there's no material culture. What has amazed scientists studying the area, but also led to doubts about its existence as a man-made site, is the pure scale and size of the structures lying beneath the waves. The biggest structure is 600 feet wide and 90 feet high. When you go down eerily under great visibility on Yonaguni, you have this massive site which initially looks like a pyramid in the deep. It's something like over 900 feet wide and it's intercut along its edges with these horizontal planes completely smooth and then walls going up at complete 90 degree angles. Labeled as number one monument, or Yonaguni Underwater Pyramid, it looks like a stepped pyramid which investigators believe closely resembles a giant gusuku from Okinawa, which still stands today. The gusuku is thought to be a mixed structure, part castle and part temple. In the case of Okinawa castles, this could be a sacred site, like a tomb. This is reminiscent of a pyramid. It's basically what we have here. These perfect rectangular corners make it difficult to believe for some researchers that this is a natural occurrence. 
When you look at these surfaces, which are very smooth, they kind of look like negatives. And I wonder whether in the medieval period this site was actually on land. And that what we're looking at here is a medieval quarry. And the stones were taken from here to the castles on Okinawa. And that is what has given this particular site its character. And I think that's something that geologists and archaeologists need to explore. If Professor Kimura's theory is right, the site at Yonaguni is evidence of an advanced civilization predating Egypt the first civilization recognized by most historians as undertaking massive building projects that have lasted. This is a portion of the Yanaguni site, a 300 to 1 scale model taken from our surveys. You enter part of a loop that circles the entire site. Here the path climbs and is met by two large sculptures. Past them is the tomb area. We think this is the most sacred area. The loop road, described by Professor Kimura, that surrounds the complex has intrigued underwater archaeologists. Its widest part measures 15 yards, and through their investigations, scientists believe they have uncovered evidence of an arched gate at its entrance. With the proposed loop road connecting all the structures at the site, the underwater region has city-like attributes. This kind of structural engineering, if proved man-made, demonstrates a civilization using techniques and technology that was advanced for its time, but was then lost. Incredibly, only a hundred miles to the north of Yonaguni, Professor Kimura is searching for more evidence of massive underwater constructions. At Shatan, there are what we believe to be ruins. They have been visible for 10 years and we have been trying to certify what they are. The Shatan site is situated off the island of Okinawa in Japan. The Ancient Discoveries team is launching a dive in search of the structures using a remote-controlled robot sub to guide the camera right up to the site. Teams of trained divers and underwater cameramen prepare to use the latest in cutting-edge diving technology. The remote-controlled robot submarine, first developed by the U.S. Navy, now allows underwater archaeologists to record high-definition images at depths of over a mile beneath the waves. Professor Kimura is leading the search. Attached to an umbilical cord, the remote control camera feeds images back to the boat. The visibility is remarkably clear at this site, allowing the divers to fully investigate the submerged ruins. Approaching the site, they find the structures that are believed to be man-made. Underneath the barnacles and coral, the divers investigate the wall-like formations. Professor Kimura believes the structures they are investigating at the site are similar in their construction pattern to those found on land at Shuri and Nakakusuku. What we are seeing here is something like a castle or a fort. In China, there are structures like stepped pyramids, and this resembles them. There is also a marked resemblance to the foundations of castles at Shuri and Nakagosuku. Could castles like this have once existed thousands of years ago on the islands of Japan, only to be lost to the depths of the ocean? Were they the centerpiece of a lost city? The ruins at Shatan were submerged about 2,000 years ago, at the same time as Pompeii was buried by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in the Mediterranean. It was the same tectonic plate movement. It's incredible to think that the submarine structures at Shatan may be linked to a global catastrophe that wreaked havoc across the globe. I hope that with this investigation, we are able to assess the effects of tectonics and global warming on the loss of civilizations. In the last two decades, 
archaeologists and scientists have made extraordinary leaps forward in our exploration of the seas. They have unearthed stunning underwater structures, pyramids, statues, streets and settlements that have transformed our understanding of history. Yet this is just the beginning. We think we know everything about the sea, but actually we've only just started to scratch the surface. In fact, we know more about the moon and the face of Mars than we do on the world's oceans. In what remains of the 21st century, our greatest ancient discoveries will not come on land, but at the bottom of the sea. And with the continuous rise of sea levels through global warming, will our modern-day megacities one day also become submerged beneath the waves.